Welcome to No Longer Conformed. I'm Eric Garthy, and we are studying You Are Accepted, Know Who You Are in Christ, Part 1, based on the book Your Identity in Christ by Neil T. Anderson. In this session, we'll be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. You are valued at a high price. Uh, let's look at our, our, our text, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning with verse 19. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Our souls were never designed by God to function as masters, nor can we claim two masters at the same time. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. I'm running my life. I'm slave to absolutely no one. That's what you think. You believe that it's freedom, but it's slavery. A life of self-seeking, self-serving, self-justifying, self-glorifying, self-centeredness, self-confidence is just serving the world, the flesh, and the devil. The world's definition of freedom is to do your own thing, independence. God's definition of freedom is to voluntarily do his thing, dependence. Ask the sexually immoral person, could you stop? The response is, why should I stop? The question was, could you stop? What you think is freedom is bondage. We are no longer slaves to sin, but servants to Christ. The apostles clearly understood this truth. Paul in Philippians 1.1, 1, 1. Uh, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in the who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. James in James 1.1, 1, 1. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes <clears throat> which are scattered abroad. Peter in 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jude in Jude 1. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James to those who are called, sanctified by God, the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. A servant is still a slave. No, it's voluntary servanthood. Being a servant of sin is bondage. Being a servant of God is freedom. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In Christ, we have freedom in three ways. We're free from the law. Galatians 5.1, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. We're free from the past, Galatians 4, verses 6 through 8. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. But then indeed, when you did not know God, you serve those which by nature are not God's. We can be free from sin. How? Realize we have been bought with a price and the Holy Spirit now lives in us, enabling us to live our lives for him, free from sin's bondage, sensitive to Satan's attacks with power over sin and grace to obey the Lord. But the choice is still ours to make. Freeing the Slaves by Neil Anderson, he wrote, 
slavery in the United States was abolished by the 13th Amendment on December 18th, 1865. How many slaves were there on December 19th? There should have been none, but many still lived like slaves because they never learned the truth. Others knew and even believed they were free, but chose to live as they always had. Now suppose several plantation owners were devastated by the Emancipation Proclamation. We're ruined, slavery has been abolished. We've lost the battle to keep our slaves, but their chief spoke and slyly responded, well, not necessarily. If they think they are still slaves, the Emancipation Proclamation will have no practical effect. We don't have a legal right over them anymore, but many of them don't know it. Keep your slaves from learning the truth and your control over them will not be challenged. One cotton farmer asked, what if the news spreads? Well, don't panic. We have another barrel in our gun. We may not be able to keep them from hearing the news, but we can keep them from understanding it. They don't call me the father of lies for nothing. We still have the potential to deceive the whole world. Just tell them that they misunderstood the 13th Amendment. Tell them that they're going to be free, not that they are free already. The truth they heard is just positional truth, not actual truth. Someday they may receive the benefits, but not now. They'll expect me to say that. They won't believe. Then pick out a few persuasive ones who are convinced they're still slaves and let them do the talking for you. Remember, most of the free people were born as slaves and have been slaves their whole lives. All we do is deceive them so that they still think they're slaves. If they continue to do what slaves do, it will not be hard to convince them that they must still be slaves. They will maintain their slave identity because of the things they do. The moment they try to profess that they are no longer a slave, just whisper in their ear. How can you even think you're no longer a slave when you're still doing things that slaves do? After all, we have the capacity to accuse the brethren day and night. Years later, many had still not heard the wonderful news that they had been freed. So naturally, they continued to live the way they had always lived. Some heard the good news, but told themselves, I'm still living like a slave, doing the same things I have always done. My experience is the same as before the proclamation, so it must not be true. I must still be a slave. They continued as if they had not received freedom. Then one day, a former slave heard the good news and received it with great joy. He checked out the validity of the proclamation and discovered that the highest authorities in the land had originated the decree. Not only that, but it personally cost the primary authority a tremendous price so that slaves could be free. The slave's life was transformed. He reasoned that it would be hypocritical to continue living as a slave, even though his feelings told him he still was. Determined to live by what he knew to be true, his experiences began to change dramatically. He realized that his old master had no authority over him and did not need to be obeyed. He gladly served the one who set him free. The purchase price for freedom in Christ was high. First Peter chapter one, verses 18 and 19. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. What does it matter that we belong to the Lord? Well, let's take a look at our text and see two arguments that the apostle Paul made. First, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, verses 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? For it is in you whom you have from God and you're not your own. For you were bought at the price, therefore, Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We were consecrated by our union with Christ. We are set apart for his use alone, possessed and inhabited by the Holy Spirit. What is a temple of God? It's a place where he dwells and a sacred place for his use. As a Christian, you're not your own, whether you like it or not. 
You were bought with a purchase price. If I sell my chainsaw to you, it's now yours. Can I still use it for my purposes? Of course not. If I use it at all, it must be as a privilege and according to the new owner's instructions. Our bodies must be kept as belonging to God and always ready for his use and prepared for his residence. Desecrate it, defile it, never. Every act of fornication or adultery, sex outside of marriage, or any other sin is committed by the believer in the sanctuary, the holy of holies where God dwells. The high priest entered only after cleansing, lest he be killed. Do you keep your body from sin as a temple of God? And then second, our bodies are under obligation to God. Verse 20, the second part of it. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Jesus created us, and then we rebelled in sin. He purchased us in our sin and then recreated us. What should our response be? Gratitude. God bought a filthy piece of junk and set about to cleaning it up, each one of us. We're not proprietors of ourselves, nor have we power over ourselves, and therefore we should not use ourselves for our own pleasures, but only according to his will for his glory. Acts chapter 27, verse 23, the second part of it, the God to whom I belong and whom I serve. Do you keep your body as a trust from God? There is a true sense of belonging in Christ. Remember the purchase price, the greatest treasure in heaven. Think about belonging to a club or organization. Obey the rules and remember member, but break the rules and lose your membership. That's man's thinking, not God's. Those who belong to God have a great and eternally enduring promise. I will never leave you nor forsake you. The Spirit seals it for us. You may sometimes break the rules, but you will never break and you'll never lose your membership. You think about that and you have a great day.